Jill, thank you so much for coming on the show. You're joining us remotely from your beautiful home in Park City. You moved to Utah during the pandemic. What led you to Utah? What led you to Park City? Yes, we call it our pandemic pivot. Uh, we lived in the Bay Area, um, right outside of Stanford, uh, for about a dozen years. Founded Motherly um, in Silicon Valley and thought I would live there for a very, very long time. Um, and hadn't really considered, there's that area can feel like a bubble sometimes where you don't even consider the other options um, outside mm -hmm. of it. And so we, uh, when the pandemic hit um, in March and when our children at the time, a kindergartner and second grader were out of school, I was running Motherly, um, a fully remote business that was with employees that were largely working mothers that were really disproportionately impacted by the pandemic. And my husband was in emerging markets and finance and actually invested in Greek banks. Um, so not a great time for either of us. Whoa, wow. <laughs> and so um, come July, I had been working with the Education Foundation in the Menlo Park area where we lived. And it became very clear to me that we were not going to have schools open um, in the fall. And our world wasn't working that way. Um, without the structural backstop of schools as childcare, in a way, um, mm -hmm. with the concerns of our children falling behind, without family nearby to support us, and in two um, very intense careers that, that were really impacted by the pandemic, uh, we had to make a massive um, radical change. And being entrepreneurial and being... Uh, you know, open to change and the such. We packed up a little U-Haul. We we drove, uh, you know, across 80 uh, and landed ourselves in Park City where we'd heard that the schools were going to be open full-time in person. Uh, and we were so pleasantly surprised by what we found because we'd never been to Utah before. Um, we were so pleasantly surprised by what we found when we arrived in Utah and in Salt Lake um, that we bought a house two weeks later and we haven't looked back. That's incredible. You're like a pioneer. You're like a modern day pioneer. <laughs> There's been so many demographic shifts and uh, people making really radical changes uh, during the pandemic. But I think that's a great, great way to put it. Honestly, um, <laughs> we've been really, really happy here. So I mean, it just it would have never, ever happened. And so the pandemic brought obviously so much hardship for so many people. Um, but for us, it's ended up being a real bright spot. What is your sense of the state of Silicon Valley? And, and I'm not asking you to trash Silicon Valley or, or kind of any of that type of stuff. I mean, you were in one of the most beautiful parts in the world. If you're right by Stanford, that's one of the most beautiful, if not the most beautiful college campus in the world. Um, and so, I mean, uh, there's it has a lot going for it, obviously. What, what's your sense of the current state of Silicon Valley, though? And if you're trying to raise a family, build a company, all of this type of stuff, um, what are the pros and cons of it these days? So I'm definitely not someone who thinks that like the Silicon Valley days are behind us and that right. there's not innovation happening there. The infrastructure that exists, the talent that it can attract is all very, very real. Um, and I do think we're starting to see some very needed sy systemic changes um, in the venture world and in tech in general, where A, we're just seeing more women um, as investors, more women being funded, um, you know, not as much as we need, but those are still positive uh, trends that we're seeing. Um, and then second, um, I'd say that we're also seeing this move towards profitability and to businesses that actually have, you know, are creating inherent value in some way. And so I think there's a lot of positivity that certainly is happening there. That said, um, I do think that the Valley takes for granted um, the fact that it is Silicon Valley. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that they are not being as um, as innovative now with companies. Um, interestingly, within two weeks of coming here, around the time I was buying, you know, buying our home, um, I received a, a call from the governor's office of Utah um, asking me about Motherly um, and about possibly headquartering and moving our headquarters to Utah. And I thought, is there a tracking device on me here? How did they know <laughs> I was here? Um, but the reality is 
they were looking in pitch book at who had closed series A's in the last year and that were in the Silicon Valley area or in any other place besides Utah. And we're being innovative enough to come and say, and, and really market Utah um, and the ecosystem that we're building here um, as a place where businesses would wanna be. Um, and so what I would say that Silicon Valley is missing out on is some of that innovation and um, a little bit of entitlement, frankly, um, that they're having that prevents them from seeing um, what's coming down in the future. Um, and then you've also got a couple other things that are obviously stacked against it. Um, the high cost of housing um, is, a, is a huge one. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's one of the reasons we moved so quickly here. And while Park City is certainly not inexpensive compared to you know Menlo Park area, um, this felt like a steal, uh, especially in August of 2020. Isn't that crazy? Oh my word. It, it is, it is absolutely crazy. It makes you realize you were like an abused person living in Menlo Park in a way. Um, and so, you know, we weren't even able to afford a home in that area um, and we were able to here. And then from a, from a raising children, we now have incoming fourth and sixth graders and there's just a different vibe here. Um, there's certainly this focus on family. There's a focus on the, on the outdoors, you know, kids just inherently aren't on devices as much I'd offer because there's so many more things to do here. Um, and I feel like I have the opportunity to raise more well-rounded children here. Um, and it's certainly, you could do it in Silicon Valley, but there's just, it's a pressure cooker um, in very real ways. Um, and so, and it's not that we are not in high achieving schools now here. Um, it is, I feel like though, a more holistic look at what a child needs to become a good human. Um, and so I feel like there's less um, headwinds against us trying to do that here in Utah compared to how it was in the Valley. Yeah, what an incredible ad for uh, Utah you just you just gave. Like the governor's office should just clip that and uh, run it on every TV station for the next little bit. In fact, I think what the government does is they put a tracking device on all U-Hauls coming from Silicon Valley <laughs> to Utah and they just reach out to wherever those U-Hauls land. They're like, hey, are you moving here? And so that's yeah. probably how you got that call or the pitch book thing. One of those two things happened. Uh, two, for sure. When did you start uh, Motherly and what was the impetus behind that? Uh, so it was first conversation about Motherly was in April of 2015. Um, my co-founder, Liz Kennedy, was an award-winning journalist and editor from The Washington Post. I had previously uh, done a lot of consulting work in actually a lot of intelligence organizations um, out of the East Coast. Um, and then I also had invented, patented, and brought to market a baby goods product. And so we had led, Liz and I, parallel lives for a while. Um, I went to the same, uh, for grad school, I went to the same school at the same time that she was an undergrad. Our husbands attended both the Naval Academy. They then served in the military at the same time. And then they both ended up going to business school at the same time. And that is when we finally met. Um, so we'd had kind of, and we had children within weeks of each other before meeting. Um, and so we were still busy working mothers um, in 2012, 2013, when we first met. Um, but when she had the, you know, the seedlings of an idea around a new brand around motherhood, um, everyone at Stanford um, GSB said you should call Jill Coltsiel. Um, And so she did. And we had that first conversation in April of 2015. We launched in what we now consider our alpha that Mother's Day, about six weeks later. Um, we then um, participated in an accelerator in the Bay Area in San Francisco um, in that summer. And then we formally launched out in December of 2015. What was the accelerator you participated in? Um, it was a more media centered accelerator called Matter. Um, it had oh, a lot yeah. of great, L yeah, a lot of great LPs, um, Google News, um, the Associated Press, um, a lot of great um, institutional legacy media players that were looking for innovation in media. Um, and we, back to your original question too, about like, why did we do this? It didn't exist. Um, we were, from my consulting days, I tend to look at deep drivers of change, um, not what are the trends that may you know, be here today, gone tomorrow, uh, but what are the deep drivers? And in the parenting space, it was very clear that one was that women are more educated than ever before. Uh, millennial uh, women are actually um, graduating at a higher rate than men right now, um, or did. Um, and then two um, was that this was the first generation of digital natives that were becoming parents. Um, and so their expectations were very different of what they would find online and how to interact. 
And then the last is that we knew that the millennial generation would have the most diverse generation. Um, and so in 2018, we hit this tipping point that we knew was coming where now the majority of births in the US are actually of minorities. And so when you take those drivers of things that are really changing the demographics and you get to parenthood and you realize there were no resources available that were meeting this mom where they are. And so we built a brand and uh, a platform that is woman centered, not baby centered, that is evidence based and expert driven and that is empowering and non judgmental. And so that's that's why and, and what we built. And what's the growth been like? I mean, how has Motherly changed since you started it to now? So our strategy has actually stayed pretty consistent. And I know a lot of companies have, you know, little pivots or evolutions along the way. Uh, but I could still go and pitch our, our 2016, 2017 investor deck, and it would be largely relevant right now. Um, our, our strategy, our thesis was that we would sit at the intersection of content, community, and commerce. And that our strategy to do that was to first connect with this consumer through content. So build a large brand through that, then start to condition her that we influence and drive her purchase decisions to ultimately convert her to be a loyal motherly consumer and ambassador. And um, we did this in part because being in Silicon Valley at the time and seeing a lot of D2C brands, um, I was watching what felt like them go, I lived in Menlo Park. I was watching them at one side of Menlo Park, pick up their suitcases of cash on Sand Hill Road <laughs> and then drive it across town to Google and Facebook. And <laughs> it felt like the Valley was still, like Sand Hill Road was still investing in Google and Facebook um, because ultimately customer acquisition costs go up over time, not down. And so what our thesis was, or what we expected was that these brands would all start to realize that they had to have a direct relationship with their consumer. And so because we had the content chops through Liz, if we built our brand through content first, then we could have deep engagement. Um, and then we could, could go where this mom needs us. Um, and this mom who's making 85% of the purchase decisions ultimately needs us to help lighten the mental load of motherhood by helping recommend products. Um, and so we grew very organically because of the content um, through organic mom to mom sharing of the content um, from kind of zero start um, to now we have over 40 million women a month that are engaging with motherly in a multi-platform approach. That's actually unbelievable. 40 million a month. What do you think the future of media is? And I'm sure even when you were in Matter, I remember when Matter was announced, and I was like, wow, that's a really interesting idea. Um, and really taking on this uh, idea of like, what is the future of media? Because it was existential even then, probably even more so now with AI and uh, various tools where like, I actually wonder um, how you're thinking about AI at Motherly. And uh, I'm sure you're getting some competitors or people in the space who it's all just AI driven. Well, AI, I think everyone needs to align their business to AI at this point, right? And it's a really, really important thing um, that we all, we can't ignore. And it is a driver of change that's going to forever change things. Um, it, um, for us, it's a compliment um, is how I would see it. And so a couple of things came to mind to me. I felt like this was either going to be the death of content or a renaissance of content. Um, and so, and I think the jury's still out, frankly, on mm -hmm. what that is. When I look at a chat GPT-4 or any of the systems where people are starting to search now and get content through, um, get their answers to questions different than um, they previously did, what I'm noticing is the challenges or problems related to that is one, you're not getting sources. And so there's a lack of credibility associated with that. And for parenting, credibility is really important. Um, mm -hmm. Again, that evidence-based, expert-driven side of things. And so without sourcing, people are a little uncertain about it. Um, the second is uh, we can all still kind of tell, you know, yes, it's learning voice and it's learning all of those things, but there's a lack of a human touch and, and um, empathy, I would say, associated with it. And so these large um, language models have a lot to go still and getting trained properly on how to be human um, in this. Uh, that'll mm -hmm. improve and it's improving every day. Um, but mom, mom needs to feel personalized connection and empathy and support in these moments as she's facing pain points. Um, and then the, the last thing um, that she 
she needs is like a whole, she needs to know that she can trust the information. She needs the right, um, the right voice and tone with it all. And then she also does need to be really personalized. So motherly, we believe can solve all of those things by aligning with AI and, and, uh, which we're actually going to be launching our beta later this month, um, um, at the end of August, early September. Um, we also we're finding, you know, we're making everyone scrambling to kind of catch up with this, but I don't want my content to be scraped at this point by others that are effectively giving it away for free. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, you see the New York Times and others changing terms of service. Motherly is doing this as well. Um, we are actually putting all of our content behind a wall um, later this month. Um, we'll let like some of our, you know, trending news content be out there, but we're going to put it behind a registration wall. Um, and this is what I mean about there possibly being a renaissance around content, because content, it's not just king, it's the kingdom, frankly, from our perspective. And so um, we're going to put that wall up and then we're also going to align with AI, uh, but have it only our AI, you know, motherly powered AI coach is going to speak in our voice. It's going to only be searching expert qualified um motherly content and approved sites to deliver its answers. And it's also going to know a lot about this woman because we know a lot about her. And so our answers will be customized to her. Doesn't it also seem like these large language models like chat GPT-4 and others are getting worse? How could that be possible? But it does seem like they're getting worse. Well, the, the group that we're working with to um, to build out our, our motherly coach um, actually talked about the guardrails that they are having to put in to make sure that the um, the model doesn't hallucinate is the word that they used. Um, and I think that's a really accurate way to describe what we think is happening. Um, it does seem to be getting worse. It does seem to be that it's hallucinating, right? For lack of a better you know analogy for it, that, that appears to be what's happening. And so um, I'm confident that with all of the brain power and the money behind this, that we'll find some solutions um, for people. Uh, but Sometimes things get worse before they get better. You said something interesting earlier that content is the kingdom. It's not just king. It's the whole entire kingdom. And I learned a version of this in a very smaller way than you, of course, at Silicon Slopes, that at the heart of every community is stories. Mm -hmm. And you can call that content or, or whatever you want. But at, the, but at the end of the day, stories are what connect us as human beings and they're what connect communities. And it's interesting that you started with stories at the heart of Motherly and expanded from there. Can you talk about like the importance of stories in a community and why that is so critical? Absolutely. Um, and you really nailed it, Glenn. Um, stories are at the heart. I mean, when you go back since the very beginning of, of you know humankind, right, these are the things that pass down information, the thing that creates empathy across us, they create discord or help facilitate discord as well, and learning. Um, there's a couple layers to this with Motherly. Um, one, yes, we started with a format um, in our content called Motherly Stories. 2015, it's when there were a lot of bloggers out there. They were telling first-person stories. Um, and what we found was that when we put those in a motherly voice, and we still had them be in first-person, but we ensured that they followed our editorial guidelines, meaning like no cursing, um, no, not being judgmental, not telling mom what to do, but really telling your story, right. And allowing someone to learn and take from that, what they wanted, um, that moms shared those stories like crazy because it was their way of saying, this is me, right? Like I didn't write this, but like, yes, I feel so seen right now. And so they would share this content. Um, and then we could turn it into video format too. Um, and so, and then those went gangbusters as people started you know, using video more on their smartphones um, over the years and social started to optimize for that. And so that's one part of it is that storytelling, people will share that content um, as a way of saying um, and identifying with it and saying who they are. Um, and so the second part of it, though, is that what we found is that there is so much more that unites us and that's universal around being mothers um, than divides us. And back in 2015, one of the reasons that we launched Motherly is that we felt like the media was t treating motherhood as almost cartoonish and that they were really feeding into these mommy wars of sorts and turning moms against each other, you know, working mom, stay at home mom, all of these types of choices that we would make. And I have a, a really strong point of view um, on ensuring that motherly is never political, um, that it is never, never um, contributing to the divisiveness in our country. And so we use storytelling also as a way 
to expand people's perspectives, right? And, and, and see a different point of view. And when you humanize it through storytelling, I think people are more open to it. Um, and so we, we dig really deep into data. Um, we run the largest statistically significant study of mothers every year. Um, we got about, we get about 10 to 20,000 women that take a very long 15 minute plus survey every year. Um, and then we don't just deliver those raw results, but we weight it to the US census. And we report that back as the state of motherhood in the US. And through that, I understand where mom lands on really political issues. Um, and Motherly has, through, through you know, me as CEO and co-founder, uh, we have a policy that unless 75, 80% of moms are aligned on a topic, we're not gonna advocate for it. Um, and so we will be out there um, talking about um, you know, paid family leave because moms are aligned and they're willing to cross uh, cross party lines to vote for someone who believes in that and wants to support it. They believe in affordable childcare, right? But when you get to reproductive rights or gun control or any of these other issues, moms are actually not aligned. Um, and so it's really important to us that we're creating a safe space to talk about these things and we can use storytelling to do that, uh, but we're not um, out there advocating because I don't want to, um, to become a place where only 50% of the of moms feel like they can find a home. Uh, because every mom, every child deserves, deserves a mom who can learn and be empowered by motherly. I love that. That's that's beautiful. We need more communities and community leaders who focus, like you just said, on creating the space. I think too often we view ourselves um, and communities view themselves as being like on a team, right? And so take it for like an ex example, like as you're either the Utah Jazz and the NBA or the Golden State Warriors and you're like rooting for you like your team or uh, but what you're describing is actually no motherly wants to be the NBA. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. We want to be the league itself and let mm -hmm. ideas compete inside of the league. But we're not going to take stances and things like that. But how have you avoided that? Because that is you're unique in do, being able to avoid that. I mean, even beer Especially is media, somehow, right? Yeah, uh, like very... media, like name a brand somehow they're in the crosshairs of this culture war. I mean, even like the most family friendly brand I could think of in Disney is in this. Like, how do we, how, how have you managed to do this in a way where like, yeah, you, you said all that, which I think, or they think is right. And you actually, but what's incredible about what you've done is you've actually lived it. It's actually like who you are yes. and what motherly is. Yes. It is hard. I dread election years. I'm not going to lie. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> Another one coming uh, up. Because, yeah, I know. So we, um, so, uh, and, and I'll give you a perfect example here um, because you're right. It's not just about the audience that's really divisive, but also your employees and your staff increasingly um, are asking uh, they they want to work someplace that aligns with their values. Mm -hmm. And so one, I'm leading with the value that we are not adding to the divisiveness, we're adding to discourse. Um, and so that's a, a value that I think motherly is increasingly known for. We lean into the data. Mom doesn't want us to be, you know, she's she's hearing that noise everywhere from every other media outlet out there. She wants motherly to be a safe place where she doesn't get bombarded with, with someone telling her how to think, right? And so um, I lean into being constantly obsessed with our audience, with with our with our own staff and our own team. Um, and then we're, when, when it becomes hard, I have to have a really strong leadership, um, candidly. So last election, um, presidential election, we had an article on, you know, I'm a mom and I'm voting for Donald Trump and here's why I'm a mom and I'm voting for Joe Biden. And here's why again, first person essay based, each of them linked back to the other ones. So you could get the other perspective. And, um, yeah, we actually did have a staff member who, um, who decided to leave motherly because they mm. felt that we were um, giving voice and a platform to um, a side, as they put it, um, that was not, uh, that they didn't feel comfortable with. Mm. And employees have a right to do that. Um, for me, that meant that that was good for us to know that they weren't committed to showing like a very holistic um, view of and meeting our audience where they were, uh, which was not always aligned. Um, and so I think you have to be willing to have the hard conversations internally. Um, you also have to be, it has to be actually a core value um, as a business um, that you are not going to do that. I, I've said to my team many times, I will shut motherly down um, as a company before, or I will leave, right? Um, before, 
I allow us to be weaponized in some way, um, contributing to, to negativity. Um, it's just not aligned with our brand and what we've built. Um, and we believe at Motherly that motherhood really matters, that it's foundational to society, and that when a mother thrives, families and communities can thrive. And so we really have to be there to serve all moms. Every mom has to feel like she can come to Motherly to get a resource. And so we really just have to live it. You said something really interesting there, meeting your audience where they are rather than, and it, and it does seem like so many institutions and media institutions that we used to revere and maybe um, some still do, and I won't name any brands or anything like that, but you, anyone on a, either side could think of 10 brands that just immediately came to their head, right? Um, they've lost that because it kind of feels like they're preaching down or they're like talking down to their community rather than talking with their community. And I think what's yes. beautiful about what Motherly does is you talk with your community, you meet the community where they are. And again, you're not trying to promote an agenda other than motherhood. It, well, and part of it is motherly in, in a world of influencers and personality driven brands, motherly is not personality driven. And that was very, very purposeful, partly because I don't think you can build a massive business um, that's truly personality driven. I think there's inherent limitations in that. Um, but, but second, because this is not the Jill show, I am not representative of all mothers in the United States or of the world. And I didn't, and by the way, I didn't found motherly because, or co-found motherly because I have all the answers. I founded it because I needed it as a resource. And so, um, to your point, we're always coming with trying to learn. Um, that's a, a core side of us is being just obsessed with who this user is and evolving with her, right? And alongside her and um, being evidence-based um, for sure. And so like when it comes to, to guns, we will sadly have more school shootings, more mass shootings in this country. Um, and we will need to talk about that. Um, we will frame that conversation around how to talk to your children about these topics and if you have a gun, these are things you need to know. If you want to advocate on either side of it, these are the resources to go. And by the way, this is what the American Academy of Pediatrics says about gun deaths now, unfortunately, being the number one cause of death in children, right? And so these are these are um, empowering people with information to um, to work through what's best for their family um, and in their in their individual circumstances. And because we're leading with this deep belief that every mom wants what's best for her children. Um, and what that means may be different for each family, but it's coming from a good, wonderful place, right? Of, of wanting what's best for your child. You're giving a masterclass on how to lead a community. I hope everyone listening or watching um, who's in the community building game or wanting to build their community, which I think any brand organization or company needs to uh, kind of hears those words because I, I really think that is a map. That's how you uh, build a sustainable, cohesive, long lasting community that doesn't focus on short wins, but long term. Um, and, and I wonder, like speaking of like kind of the long term gains and wins of uh, building a community, how about monetizing the community? How has that changed over time with Motherly? How have you monetized uh, the, the site and the overall brand? So if I were looking back at something that we did do, you know, if I could go back and shift and change what we did, um, we didn't focus on monetization in the beginning. We were really obsessed with building this audience out. This was back in 2015. This is how things were done in a way. Um, and I didn't come from a media monetization background myself, nor did my co-founder. And so I think we just didn't know what we didn't know. And in retrospect, I wished that I wish that we had um brought in some expertise on the media business side of things. Um, but I was also, I didn't want to be a media business, frankly, mm -hmm. um, for all the reasons that we're seeing now. <laughs> um, and so I, I didn't want to be a media business. And so I probably wrongly pushed back on monetizing um, because I do think that you are what, how you monetize, right? Like if you, if the majority of your revenue comes from being a media company, uh, from being a media business, then you're a media company. And I really, really didn't want to be a media company, uh, but I think we could have done better if we had uh, monetized sooner. Um, and so Motherly does, the, the majority of our revenue comes from not bottom of the funnel um, programmatic um, ads, but top of the funnel brand awareness, custom content campaigns. 
Um, and so that is the vast majority of our um, of our revenue right now. Um, we actually just finalized a partnership with Penske um, and She Media, where we are forming the Motherly Media Group, um, where we now are able to take their amazing reach and expertise in ad targeting and the, the programmatic side of things with Motherly's very strong brand and ability, you know, the custom content studio that mm -hmm. we have and bring those together. Um, and so we are um, now in market with um, the Motherly Media Group and are able to do really large campaigns that extend beyond just Motherly, but through all these other, you know, sometimes smaller publishers. Um, so that you can get really great targeting on those types of things. So that's where the majority of our revenue comes from. We do have an affiliate uh, making recommendations um, side of the business, and we are we just closed our Series B, and we'll be doubling down now on the motherly shop and really building out the biggest, best parenting, uh, baby, child e-commerce site that we possibly can over the next couple of years. That's interesting because yeah, there, there's a few revenue models you can do in the community game, right? And mm -hmm. and you're doing the. Uh, high level uh, brands that want to interact with your audience and, mm -hmm. uh, and, and you know, and the vice versa, right? Your audience wants to interact with those brands, mm -hmm. right? Which is the, that's where, you know, you've found something in, in right. my opinion with the community is they're like, yeah, mm -hmm. we're glad you brought this brand to us because yes. we want to learn exactly. from them, right? Like this right. We're solving great. each of the thousands of pain points that a mother experiences along the journey of motherhood from conception to college. Um, all have an area where she needs support and empathy from a community, right? Or storytelling or things that validate her in some way. So she feels seen. She always needs something evidence-based and expert driven. That's really service oriented of like, how do I get through this pain point? And there is 90% of the time there's a product aligned with that too. And so we are not, um, it's not this like salesy, just throwing mm -hmm. something her way. We're really holistically solving her, her, her problem or her challenge and pain point that she's faced by giving her all of those things. Um, so there is a content community and commerce component on solving every single problem that she's faced with. It's interesting too, that you're going into the commerce space and building uh, the, the shop, which I think, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. That, that That's going to be incredible for the exact same reason. Have you thought about, I mean, the other way that I think about uh, communities monetizing is events. Do you do any events? Mm -hmm. Uh, we had some of the most amazing events pre-COVID. Um, so we have a book um, called The Motherly Guide to Becoming Mama. Um, it's on Amazon. It's all the different places, right? Um, and it is um, the most inclusive modern guide to pregnancy and, and postpartum um, that's out there. Um, it's one of the few, I mean, every, it's a five-star reviewed book on Amazon without us really doing anything. It's kind of this, um, this sleeper hit that's out there. And so uh, we have digital classes also that relate and are aligned around that. Um, but we also did events. So we did this event called Becoming Mama. We brought together about 200 mothers in different communities um, to pull her together um, in her local community to talk about what it is to to become a, mo a mother, to become mama. Um, and then we also had postpartum events that would, for many women, would be the first time that they'd left the house except to go to the doctor. Um, so like that fourth trimester time frame, and those were mom and baby events. Um, they were fabulous. Um, and I do think we'll be bringing those back. Um, I think that even in this last year, um, while we've seen events come back um, in a very big way, you know, the Taylor Swift events of the world right now, mm -hmm. um, pregnancy is one of those that takes a little bit longer, right? Like there's a health component and worry about things. And not that, you know, the pandemic is over, thank God. Um, but um, I think it's taken a little while for brands to want to get back on board to sponsoring those. Um, but I do think they'll be coming back and they're amazing. Um, as a fully remote business, um, as, as a founder and CEO, to see this brand that I built come to life in real life is, is just a phenomenal experience. By the way, you said something else interesting that, that I want to double click on, and that is your uh, new partnership with Penske. For those who don't know, Penske is an incredible brand. Don't, I believe they own Rolling Stone, Hollywood Reporter, South yes. by Southwest, um, and on and on and on. Oh. Um, Penske is an incredible company and uh, platform for major, major brands. So for you to be a, one of those brands is incredible. And how did that go about? How did that come about? Uh, Sorry. Yeah, so when we were, um, we had some inbound interest in Motherly from an acquisition standpoint um, at the beginning of this year. Um, this was in the middle of a lot of uncertainty, uh, a lot of bank failures, a lot of media and tech layoffs and such. And so um, we ended up taking that inbound interest and running a bit of a process as part of that, trying to see you know, what's out there, um, what do we see is next for Motherly. 
through that, we ended up um, finding an amazing investor, um, strategic investor on the Series B side of the business um, that can enable us to really double down on the e-commerce potential that Motherly has. Um, but in parallel with that, through that process, we got to know She Knows and Penske quite well also. And through that, um, I started to identify that they had this amazing audience extension opportunity, which the only time we ever lost a deal, honestly, in, in the media side was because we just didn't have quite that audience extension capability. Uh, but we had this amazing brand that, that, that our clients wanted to be associated with. And so, and through these conversations with Penske and She Knows, one of their, their platforms, we determined that like one plus one can definitely equal more than two on the media side. So let's come together in a joint venture partnership of sorts um, on the media side of the business. And that also frees motherly, frees me up from a mind space perspective to really focus on the e-commerce side of the business, knowing that we've got an amazing partner on, on the media side. Wait, tell me what audience, audience extension is. I don't, actually don't even know what that means. Yeah. So um, what sometimes happens um, when you're looking at, um, you know, programmatic ad type things, uh -huh. right? And they want to target um, maybe a mom of a certain or a woman of a certain age with certain age children or a certain household income. Uh, because Motherly is multi-platform with 40 million, um, engaging 40 million women across all of our platforms, that includes social video viewers and social engagement and all of that. But our site traffic, as we meet mom where they are, mm -hmm. people are going to websites a little less and less, right? And so our inventory on that side maybe wouldn't allow us to build um, to to win the really large deals that were out there. Um, we, we would sometimes hear um, from like major retailers, as an example, we love the motherly brand. We want to be there. Your audience is the right audience. But for this particular campaign, we can only have three partners with us. And Motherly doesn't have the audience extension, meaning other smaller platforms under us that we can uh, target to make the audience on the website for ad delivery large enough. And so, um, so they'd be like, oh, like it really pains us, but like we're gonna have to go with this bigger partner that we don't actually like as much as you from a brand association perspective. Um, and so now this gives our clients the best of both worlds. Um, it enables them to have through the hundreds of publishers that she knows and Penske has mm -hmm. under in its network, uh, we can deliver ads and do ad targeting um, of the content that Motherly creates for the brand across and hit, you know, frankly, almost every woman in the in the country, right, for these campaigns. And so it gives us the lift that we need on the audience size, and then it gives um, Penske and She Media the um, the lift that it needs on the brand side around parenting. I see that that makes total sense. I never know how to ask this question um, to like community platforms, whereas like in tech, uh, everyone just beats their chest about how much they've raised. So I'm not sure like like um, w as you were raising money, how much money have you raised up to date? I don't know if you've ever publicly said that or not. And yeah, that's no, why I'm like kind of know, hesitant. These things just, you know, the pitch books <laughs> of the world, the crunch bases, yeah. it's out there whether you want it to be or not. Um, yeah. So based on the Series B now, we've raised 15 million um, um, over, over these years through uh, angel round, um, our seed, our A, and now our B. Um, and so relatively small amount compared to those. And, yeah. you know, I'd, I'd like to think that the the world's changing a bit and people um, start to be a little embarrassed if they've raised too much, um, frankly, uh, as <laughs> we start true, to move actually. towards. <laughs> uh, so um, 15 million is on the, on the smaller side, but we've got the media business to break even um, at this point um, and very much turning the corner now to profitability. Um, so that we're able to invest in this e-commerce side of things. And we we believe we have a very quick path to profitability there too. What have you learned about raising money um, from investors and VCs? And in particular, like I, I know the numbers are abysmal. Is it like mm -hmm. 1% that venture? Less than. Yeah, yeah no. less than 1% right. well, well, of venture you, deals go to women, a founded company? When you, I think it's like maybe it's 1.9. It yeah, changes something each crazy year. like 1. that. 1.9 or Point nine, yeah. Um, but when you cut that, not just by women, but by mothers, it's down even more because it's not, you know, the the penalty isn't just against being a woman. It's really about the fact that women become mothers. Uh, at the end of the day, it really is a motherhood penalty, I would say. Um, and so what I've learned several things. Um, one is that as an entrepreneur who's forward thinking, um, sometimes you just have to wait for the world to catch up with you and your ideas. Um, and, and that 
Um, I believe that success is a combination of passion and persistence. Um, sometimes you just have to stay alive long enough to be successful um, and for the, the trends to kind of turn your way ultimately. Um, and so I, I've definitely learned persistence um, through that. I've also learned, and, and um, I think that smart investors will agree and not see this as being you know, so negative, but investors are really sheep in many ways. Um, it is, and, and I know that sounds derogatory, but it's, it really is just that they are, um, they're trying to minimize risk, not take yep. risk along the way. Crazy? When it's exactly yeah. like they call themselves venture capitalists, which is the opposite right. of that. Right. And so, um, and so it's, you know, you just got to get that lead, right? Once you get that lead or you get, um, you know, once we had like eight VC and founders fund, um, in our cap table, suddenly people were so interested. Right. <laughs> um, and so, uh, it's, and that's like most things in life, right. Um, it, it they're humans too. And, and they're looking to, they don't want to make a wrong mistake. And, um, but I also have found that the other thing I've learned is that you need to be interviewing your investors as much as they're interviewing you and vetting you. Um, you want to find people that are really aligned from a culture, from a value, um, from what you're trying to build, how long it's going to take, what this looks like. Um, and we've been really lucky. We've had we've had great investors, um, and they have, I think, over time, again, waiting things out. I think that people are starting to see that women-owned businesses or women-run businesses. Uh, are outperforming um, over the long term, and that when faced with crises, with pandemics, and other things like that, um, we tend to have grace under pressure. Uh, and so, I think you're starting to see um, a more of an understanding um, and appreciation for that. As I understand it, you were diagnosed with MS right around the time you uh, launched Motherly. What has that been like? That is a serious, serious diagnosis. Absolutely. Um, so this was uh, three months, to your point, um, after launching Motherly Fully. So this was actually on St. Patrick's Day of 2016 um, that I was formally diagnosed. I was very, very, very blessed um, in a number of ways to be diagnosed the way that I was. Um, it was very fast. I was diagnosed within 10 days of onset of my symptoms. Um, some people, it takes 10 years to be diagnosed. Mm. And um, I also had, I was living in you know Silicon Valley area then. Um, UCSF is one of the top neurology and MS um, departments in, in the country, in the world. Um, so I had amazing access to medical care. I had a great network. I'm educated and feel that appropriate level of entitlement to advocate for myself and, and my health. Um, so I was comfortable researching and pushing hard when needed to make sure I was getting the care I needed great family support and insurance, right? And so like not having any one of those things could lead to a very, very different outcome. Um, and also um, I was just reading Dr. Hauser's book, um, The Face Laughs While the Brain Cries is what it's called. And it's about his 50 year journey with um, working as a neurologist in MS. And we are pretty close to a cure at this point um, with the B cell depletion therapies that exist now. And that I have been very lucky to be on, um, you know, almost since the beginning of my diagnosis, um, we're able to stop MS in its tracks. Um, but that diagnosis three months after launching motherly with two toddlers um, at that time and a husband who was, uh, you know, just out of business school and, and changing careers and launching his career it was identity crushing um, yeah. and really, really challenging. Um, it, when when faced with a with a diagnosis with an incurable diagnosis, what what happens is this this identity shift in a moment, and you have this period where you you suddenly mourn this future that you didn't even know you had imagined for yourself when it, it it's put in jeopardy. Uh, things like you know, dancing at my children's weddings or hiking and be having an active lifestyle with my husband when we're empty nester, like those things all sudden that I didn't even know I had expected or dreamed for myself um, came into question. And um, it was really, really challenging. And uh, again, amazing medical care um, enabled me to very quickly get on um, very aggressive and very effective therapies um, within, you know, 10, you know, within, I guess, a month of actually being diagnosed. And so I have no symptoms and I've had no progression of MS. Uh, but it also really scared me because um, there's been a lot of adv medical advancements during the last, you know, seven years since I've been diagnosed. And, but people saw it as people who had experienced MS in their families or through friends saw it as 
you know, not a death sentence, but like a, a fast track to a wheelchair um, and mm-hmm. cognitive impairment and all of these other things that as a CEO, um, you know, running a venture backed business was super scary. Um, and so um, I, I had to consult with attorneys and be really careful about how I shared this diagnosis in the beginning with investors. Um, and um, looking back, I think I made the right calls along the way. Um, and now um, I'm able to be very, very public about it and help um, be, I, I talk about this on podcasts and other places, because if someone is diagnosed with MS now or has someone, a friend or family member who is, I want them to see me. I want them to see and hear my story. So then that, that moment of desperation and a fear, they they see and hear me and they have hope. Well, it must have been scary, too, like as you're like waiting to figure out what the diagnosis actually is. There's another thing it could have been that kind of is, to use your words, a death sentence, which is ALS. Mm-hmm. Those are mm-hmm. similar symptoms. Right. And so it li- and that is, um, you know, something that's just like, all right, my entire life has changed here. What is that yeah. like, like that waiting for like, what could this be? These symptoms could be, you know, uh, one of a couple things like the, the, the two yeah. worst ones are like the MS or the absolute worst. Or, or with brain tumor ones. too. Yeah, yeah. Or I mean, yeah. I, I mean, there's all sorts of crazy. Yeah, like what it mine, be, yeah. mine um, presented it with optic neuritis, um, which is almost like having a bug screen over your eyes um, as you're looking through. So you can, for, my, for me at least, I could still see and I had good peripheral vision, um, but I had a, a hard time just like I was looking through a screen or like a bug screen, like up close. Um, and, uh, and I ignored it the first day. Um, cause MS symptoms tend to like happen, like, oh, like instantaneously. Um, I was working three months again into launching motherly. Um, I was on my computer, I was typing away and I, um, I, I wear contacts. And so I thought I had gotten like makeup concealer on my contact. And so I just ignored it. The next day I was extra careful putting my contact in and, it was still there. I was like, oh, this feels not good. Um, and so I, I went to the optometrist, which when you're 35 years old um, and having eyesight problems like that, they fit you right in. Um, and uh, they were, we were doing retina scans. They said things like brain tumor, like pushing up on my retina perhaps, mm. or like creating this issue. Um, went into, and then, then it gets into where you have to advocate for yourself. Um, oh, the MRI wait is very, very long. Well, no, I want answers now. So, you know, calling around and finding the place and traveling to the MRI to get in to do it. Then the doctor says, we, we think it's MS and that's super scary, but we don't hundred percent know you should go see a neurologist. Well, getting in with a neurologist without a diagnosis is really hard too. Um, And I I remember going to Stanford first and Stanford said, well, when you have an MS diagnosis, we'll see you. I said, but how do I get the MS diagnosis if you don't see me? Um, and so this is, again, what can start to happen um, for people and how, how it can take forever to get diagnosed. Um, and so I, through my network, was able to get um, over to UCSF, which little did I know is has an even better uh, you know, MS neurology um, department, and was able to get in with the head of the, um, the clinic and the department there. And so I was able to then do like the very extensive being an origin study where I could get a very detailed um, uh, diagnostic test done all in one day, starting at 7.20 in the morning. Um, and I was able to be diagnosed almost immediately um, and wow. you know, really a certain diagnosis based on everything that I was experiencing in all of my results. And, and the fact that I had multiple lesions on my brain that showed that I'd had some flares in the past that just hadn't impacted me. That's incredible, wow. Jill, I can't thank you enough for coming on. I want I want to end with this one question for you with with you, which is, what have you learned about leadership? What are some great leadership lessons you've learned leading motherly, leading yourself, leading your life? Authenticity always wins. Um, would be would be my primary lesson. Um, I again came from a consulting world, which is more male dominated, um, I, or was then, um, and you know. 2010s of sorts. Um, I um, also worked in defense contracting and consulting and um, an intelligence defense intelligence world. Um, so in a very male dominated world. And so a lot of my amazing role models were men. Um, and I learned a ton. Um, and then as I started to lead, I, you know, you pick pieces of, of what worked and what didn't work, what you saw. And for me, 
over the years, I found that when I lean into who I am, um, and that is a woman, that is a mother, um, that when I lead with that kind of authenticity and I allow myself to be vulnerable along the way, um, goodness comes from that. Um, and being vulnerable along the way means like during the pandemic, you know, expressing the challenges I was experiencing as a mother and as a working mother, um, you know, and, and, and sharing, I believe in radical transparency. Um, and so sharing with my team along the way, um, I think that that, that authenticity and that transparency, um, people want to follow that. Um, and then also sharing when I've made mistakes, right. Along the way, we have this, um, this, this thought process or this, this like saying within motherly, which is, uh, just do the next right thing. Um, society and culture is evolving um, very, very quickly these days. Um, a lot of acceleration there. And I am going to put my foot in my mouth. I am going to make mistakes along the way. Um, and my goal is to shorten the time period from making that mistake to owning up to that mistake. Um, so even if it's in the same conversation, to go back and say, I just realized I said this thing and that is, I can see how that would come across wrong. That is not what I meant. I want to like, explain what I what I really meant or if I say something and find out three weeks later because someone flags it for me that I used a term or a word that wasn't you know maybe not PC or, or not appropriate that I come back and I own that and I say like I didn't know but I'm learning and I'm going to do the next right thing um, along the way and so to me I, that's how I parent too right like I I I am going to make, I'm learning along the way. Um, I tell my 11 year old, she has never been an 11 year old before and she's learning. And I have never been a mom to an 11 year old before. And we are going to figure this out together and we are going to make mistakes, but we're on the team together. And I think there's respect and authenticity um, or that, that authenticity is ultimately respected. So that'd be the number one for me. It's like, don't try to be the leader that someone else is, be who you are and, and build and grow from that. Jill, we're so lucky you're Utah now. So lucky you uh, came to this state and congratulations on everything you've built. It's really inspiring. And uh, yeah, let's get you more engaged in this community and in Silicon Slopes because really, I mean, your voice here and what you're building and the way you bring yourself to it is is inspiring. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Clint. I really do look forward to being more and more involved in the community here. I think it's a great one and we have so much potential in Utah and Silicon Slopes. Um, I'm really excited to be part of that. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. Great talking to you. Thank you.